Happy Easter and welcome to Mohawk Valley Church. I'm so glad you guys could be here with us this morning. My name's Susie and we are going to have an incredible Easter morning celebrating together. Before we jump into worship, I want to ask you guys to do something for me. So growing up in church on Easter Sunday, my pastor would say, He is risen. And all of the church would repeat by saying, he is risen indeed. So would you do that with me? Just humor me. I know that I can't hear you, but I can hear you in spirit. And I know that God can hear everything that you're saying, every bit of worship that's coming from your heart this morning. So let's try it. You ready? He is risen. Okay. That was all right, but I know you guys weren't giving it your very best. So we're going to do it one more time. We want our neighbors to hear us. If you have sleeping kids, it's okay to wake them up. It's 10 o'clock. They should be up now anyway. All right, so let's try that one more time. You ready? He is risen. That was much better. We're going to go into a time of worship. And as we do, I want to encourage you, as we always do on Sunday morning online campus, stand to your feet. Let's give God our very best this morning. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you All my failures I tried to hide It was my truth Yeah! Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave
prosper when the darkness falls you won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph my God will
I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, and I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory right now. The battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, and I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see The battle belongs to you, Lord, right now. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, oh Sun 
that was such a great time of worship. I hope that each one of you are really experiencing the presence of God in your homes on this Easter morning. I want to ask you to do one more thing for me. Would you check in on Facebook to Mohawk Valley Church to let everyone know that you are attending church this morning on Easter? So you can do that by going to your Facebook page. You'll see a little button that says check in. You'll type in Mohawk Valley Church and then you can write a little comment. You can post a picture of yourself. And that way we can let the world know that even though we can't gather together in a building this morning, that we are still gathering as the church to lift the name of Jesus high. Psalm 145 verse three says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonder, wonderful works. And verse seven says, they celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. I want to encourage you this morning to be faithful church as you are celebrating God's abundant giveness abundant goodness. And I want to give an extra special thank you to every single person who's continuing to give to church. If you call Mohawk Valley Church your home church, or maybe you're visiting online and you would say, you know what? I want to be a part of what God is doing. This is your opportunity to give and to celebrate God's abundant goodness to your life. How can you give? We're going to post some links to tell you just how to do that. There's so many different ways you can give on our website. You can text to give, you can mail in your gift this morning. So make sure you check that out. And now we're gonna jump into our message. We have something extra special. You're not just gonna hear from Mike today. You're gonna hear from a few different people as we celebrate this wonderful Easter together. Happy Easter. I'm so glad that we're able to bring this Easter message to you this morning. Come on, give us a wave, a high five. Let us know where you're watching from this morning. Man, we have a great message for you prepared today. It's gonna to be a little different, but I believe that God wants to speak to lives and hearts this morning. The title of the message is Victory in the Midst of Defeat. You know what? Defeat can be temporary or it can be permanent. It depends on you and how you handle that defeat. We're gonna look at a few different situations and people and events that took place in God's word and one where defeat became permanent, another where defeat was only temporary. So this message is gonna be a little different. You're gonna hear from all of our pastors this morning. You're gonna hear from myself, Pastor Susie, and Pastor Jared. And so first we're gonna hear from Pastor Jared and he's gonna to talk to us about betrayal. Have you ever had a, a victory that was just so high and, and so good, but then all of a sudden something came along and it swept it out from under you? Maybe you were up for a promotion and rather than getting it, you found out that you actually were getting laid off or, or some other situation where your expectations were totally changed and it felt like a, a hopeless situation. Well, the disciples found themselves in just such a situation in Matthew 26, starting at verse 20 we read, it was evening when he reclined at the table with the 12, he being Jesus. We see from the very beginning, it's a casual environment. The disciples have been with Jesus for quite a bit of his ministry at this point, and they're comfortable. They've already been through the good teacher versus uh, whom man say I am, and they, they have an understanding of him as the Messiah, and, and they're, they're quite comfortable in, the, in this situation now, and, and they're, they're sitting down for what in the Jewish feast would have been this, this great celebration. And it would have been such a great honor to have this with Jesus. And so needless to say, they, they were pretty excited about the, this event and feeling pretty comfortable when Jesus completely shatters all their expectations of what the coming days were gonna look like for them. And when we pick up a little further on, he says, truly I say, one of you will betray me. With that one line, everything changed for the disciples. They start off by just trying to process what he was even saying. And then quickly it turns into, well, what if it's, what if it's me? What, what if I'm the one? And they begin trying to get off the hook asking like, Lord, is it I? And he begins to tell them that it's not. And later down in verse, we find out that it's, it's Judas is the one that's gonna betray him. And so now they're sitting there, they're going from like complete just shock and surprise 
to the terror of is it me, to now maybe even feeling some anger and definitely betrayal, that it's not just that they're coming from the outside, but it's one of them that is betraying Jesus. And so now they're sitting there just with all their expectations of what's about to happen are completely shattered. And at this point, if, if Jesus had just left them at this point, things would have not gone well for the disciples. They would have been in complete, um, just utter run in, this, in that sense. But then he then goes on to lead them into the first communion. And he takes the bread and he breaks it and he passes it amongst them. And he says, take and eat my body. And he begins to give an example of how his body is to be broken for them. And then he takes the wine, pours it. And as he passes it, and they're looking at it, and he begins to explain how this represents his blood that will be shed very soon, and how it, it represents forgiveness of sins for all mankind. So now we see they go from this, this excited evening to their world's been completely turned upside down. And then just a, a mere matter of moments, as, as Christ leads them through this, they now begin to become hopeful again. And they begin to see and get a glimpse of his true purpose and understand what it is and his, his actual plan. And as things begin to click and, and hope begins to come back, I, I can almost imagine them to kind of be, start to relax a little bit and then even become excited as they partake in communion with their Lord and Savior. And they begin to imagine, okay, now that we've gone through this, what is it that is going to actually happen? And, I, and they start to hope again and they start to believe in, and not just now for an earthly kingdom, but they begin to start to understand what Christ is talking about, the forgiveness of sins. And this is bigger than even we've realized before. And, and how they started off that night with utter betrayal and feeling like they were completely alone and in darkness to the end on such a triumphant victory with their Savior Christ. Wow. Could you imagine being there at that very first communion? Those disciples, they felt defeated. Judas betrayed them. Jesus definitely felt betrayed, but then they had victory in that very first communion. That was, that was amazing. Well, now we're going to hear from Pastor Susie, and we want to, Susie's going to take a deeper look into Peter's denial of Jesus. Let's take a look. That night after Jesus was betrayed, the Bible tells us that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And we read in Luke chapter 22 that it was shortly after this that Jesus was seized and taken to the house of the high priest. And it's in this same passage of scripture that we're reminded of one of Jesus's closest disciples, a man named Peter. Now, Peter had been with Jesus over these months of ministry. He had walked with him and experienced incredible highs, amazing victories and celebrations. And he had also walked with Jesus through the lows and agonized with him in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed. But in this passage, we see Peter in a different light because the Bible tells us that instead of following close, that Peter followed at a distance. He followed at a distance and he found himself in the courtyard of the high priest that night. He saw that some people had gathered and they started a fire a lot like this one. So Peter took a seat near the fire. And it was in that moment that a young servant woman saw Peter and did a double take. Maybe you've been walking through the grocery store and out of the corner of your eye, you think you see somebody that you know. That was what happened with her and Peter. And she saw him and recognized him. And she went up to him and said, you, you were with him. Well, Peter denies it and says, no, I was never there. Shortly after, a second person, a man this time, comes up to Peter and this time not only says you were with him, says you were one of his. Again, Peter denies knowing Jesus. And the Bible says just one hour later, a third person comes to Peter and says, you, I know you were with him for surely you're a Galilean. Well, this time Peter responds in what I can only imagine is frustration and anger. And he snaps at him. I don't know what you're talking about. In that moment, the Bible says that even as the words are coming out of Peter's mouth, the rooster crows three times. And just as the rooster is crowing, Jesus locks eyes with Peter. 
And in that moment of time, you can imagine the dread and the remorse that fills Peter's heart as he's reminded of words that were spoken to him by Jesus just hours before when he said, Peter, even today before the rooster crows three times, you or before the rooster crows, you will betray me three times. You know, we've all been in those places, haven't we? Places that we've denied Peter, times in our lives that the fire has grown cold in our hearts. And how did Peter react? You see, Peter reacted much differently than Judas did because we read that Peter left and he wept bitterly. Maybe today you can identify with Peter. I'm reminded of a moment in time I experienced when I was just a young girl in high school and I loved the Lord and I was doing my best to follow him. And I had a moment in time that I was asked and invited to pray at a school for a school function. This was way back in the day in my small town in Indiana where I grew up where prayer was still allowed in school by students. And in that moment, instead of rising up to give God glory, I froze and I said, no way. Maybe even now you can think of a moment in time, maybe even this week, maybe it was this morning, maybe last night, that you're so ashamed of a time that you betrayed the Lord. Let me encourage you. God wants to give you victory in the midst of deceit, of defeat. You see, when we continue to read about Peter, we see in the book of Acts, Acts of chapter two, that Peter was used in amazing ways by God. We see Peter preaching to the crowds, telling the people that if you repent, if you're baptized, that you will be saved. And we read that in one day, over 3,000 people were added to the church. God can use Peter and God can use you. You know, maybe this morning you're feeling like this is the worst Easter ever. Maybe you've spent every Easter in church from the time you were this high, and this is the first year you've never been there and you're feeling defeated. Let me encourage you today. Guess what? Easter is not canceled. Church is not canceled. Jesus' resurrection is not canceled. And the way God wants to use you is not canceled. He wants to bring you victory, even in the midst of defeat today. Be encouraged and know God has a plan for you. God wants to use you and he wants to bring you through even those places of betrayal, those times that you're ashamed of, to show glory in and through your life. Guys, let's be the church and trust God for the victory he wants to bring to our lives. I couldn't imagine the regret that Peter had. Judas, though, Judas stayed in his defeat, and ultimately Judas took his own life. But Peter, Peter was remorseful in the midst of his denial, in the midst of his defeat. And guess what? Peter went on to pioneer one of the greatest movements known to man, the Church of Jesus Christ. See, those two stories lead us up to the ultimate story of victory the ultimate story of victory in the midst of defeat. See, Jesus, he was betrayed, he was arrested, he was denied by Peter and crucified on a cross. So I wanna take you to the scene where Jesus is being buried. A man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, he goes to Pilate and he asks for Jesus' body. Pilate obliges and says, okay, you can have Jesus' body and bury him. So I want to take you to Matthew chapter 27, verse 59. It says this, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. You see, by all appearances, Jesus and his disciples had been defeated. Jesus had died the most horrific death. Now he was buried and sealed in a tomb. Satan, he thinks it's over. He thinks that he is one. Oh, he's buried, he's sealed in a tomb. But guess what? Jesus was just setting the stage for the greatest victory in the world. 
Satan thinks it's over, but <laughs> it's not over. How many times have you seen it? Satan thinks that he has won only to find out that's not so, that, that God was just setting the stage. I mean, we look back at God's word. We look at the story of maybe Daniel in the lion's den, where it looks like the enemy has won. It looks like Satan has won. Daniel's in the lion's den, but God was just setting the stage for a victory. We look at three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing in a fiery furnace. By all appearances, it looked like they were going into defeat. Only to find out God was using that to set the stage for an entire nation to serve him. Well, then we jump to the New Testament. We look at a man like Lazarus. He was dead in his tomb for three days. The enemy thought he had won. It looked like it was over. Jesus was just setting the stage. God was setting the stage for a great victory. And Jesus raises him from the dead. Right now, it looked like in our story that it was over. It looked like Satan had won. But in fact, Jesus had, or God had Satan right where he wanted him. Are there parts of your life today? Are there parts of your life this morning that you feel like they've died and they've been buried? Maybe it's your hopes, maybe it's your dreams or your aspirations. You feel like you're living in defeat, struggling with that sin over and over and over. You didn't get that job or promotion that you were hoping for. We're quarantined at home. Feels like we're living in defeat. Maybe your marriage is struggling this morning. And it feels like the good that you desire is sealed on the other side of a stone. And it looked like, how am I going to get there? But on the third day, church, <laughs> on the third day, when all hope looks like it is gone, despair may start to set in. The Bible says that there was a violent earthquake, a violent earthquake, and the earth began to shake. Let me tell you, some of your worlds need to shake this morning. Some of you need to be shaken free. They need to be shaken because you're living for all the wrong reasons. You're putting your faith in this world. You're putting your faith in your money, your jobs, your careers, your friends, and putting them in all the wrong places. This morning, God wants to shake the very foundation that you're sitting on today. He wants to shake it so that everything fades away till only he is left. The Bible says on the third day, on the third day, an angel came down and rolled the stone away. That's the greatest part of this whole thing, church, is we don't have to do it. God is not saying you have to be strong enough, smart enough, wise enough, good enough. Just as that angel came down from heaven, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. God never expects us to do it. He's going to give you the power through his Holy Spirit to conquer, to find victory in the midst of your defeat this morning. We don't have to do it. It's all through the power of Jesus and what he did on the cross. He is risen in Jesus' name. Let's read this scripture before, but let's read this scripture now. It's powerful, it's found in Matthew chapter 28, verse two and five. It says this, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Jump down to verse five, it says this, the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he has said. Church, we need to declare this morning that he has risen, that we can have victory in the midst of the feet. This is our resurrection Sunday morning. And as Pastor Susie has said, Easter is not canceled, all right? Jesus is alive today. I don't care where you're watching from this morning. Maybe it's your bedroom, your kitchen, your living room, or who you're watching it with. No, no, we might not be able to come together, you know, in the, in the church like we're used to, but Easter is not canceled. Jesus is still alive, and we still serve a God who is allowing us, who's giving us the power through his Holy Spirit to find victory in the midst of our defeats. You may be facing a situation this morning. I think we're all facing situations this morning where we feel like, 
how are we going to get out of this? You may be facing a situation this morning that has absolutely nothing to do with COVID-19, nothing to do with a virus, nothing to do with quarantine. In fact, you've been struggling for weeks and months, maybe years or even decades. I don't know who you are or where you're watching from this morning. I want you to know that Jesus died on the cross and he has risen today for you and for me. He is our way maker this morning. I want you to know that Jesus is our way maker. All right, he is our miracle worker. Come on, we need some miracles this morning, don't we? I, I know that there's people watching, you need a miracle in your marriage. You need a miracle in your jobs. You need a miracle in your physical body. I know there's those that have contracted the virus and they're struggling. We need miracles this morning. We serve a God who still does the impossible. He is a promise keeper. All right, we, we is our way maker. He is a promise keeper. He's given you a promise. He is going to keep it. He is our light in the darkness. Church, he is our light in the darkness. I don't care how dark you feel like your life is. I don't care how far you feel like your defeat right now, how where you're living in your defeat. I want you to know that he is the light in the darkness, that he will come. He will wrap his arms of love around you. He'll pick you up out of the midst of your darkness and set you in victory, set you on a strong ground. He is my God. He is my God. Jesus is our way maker. This morning, we're gonna sing this song in just a minute. But I want you to know, and I want you to make this your anthem this morning, all right? That Jesus is your way maker, all right? Make it this your anthem. We're gonna sing this in just a minute because someone needs to get this in their spirit. All right, some of you have been struggling and maybe it is because of the quarantine. Maybe it is just, you know, your normal life has just been shifted and rocked and you just don't know how to handle it. Some of you, as I said, you've been struggling for weeks and months. I want you to know wherever you're watching from that he is our way maker. He is our promise keeper. He is that light in the darkness. So I want you to sit there or stand there or whatever you feel comfortable with, but Close your eyes and let's sing this with the band this morning. Jesus is our way maker.
He is our way maker. He is our miracle worker. And I don't know where you're watching from this morning, but I believe that there are people watching that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That Jesus that we're talking about that is gonna be your way maker, you don't know him and have a personal relationship with him. This Easter Sunday, 2020, in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic, Jesus sees you. He sees your hurt, he sees your brokenness, and the, and the Jesus that we talked about, who died and rose again, he rose for your sins and for mine. And so I wanna give you an opportunity to accept him as your Lord and Savior this morning. That you would say yes to Jesus. Yes, I wanna follow you. Yes, I wanna put my life in your hands. In just a minute in the comments, we're gonna drop a number in the comments and you can text the word life to that number. And it's just a way for us to follow up, but I wanna pray for you this morning, all right? Because this is a huge decision. This is a life-altering decision, all right? So, you know, just in your hearts, if that is you, just bow your head with me this morning. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, for those that are making a decision to follow you, Lord, that you give them peace, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, that you would come in, you'd forgive them their sins. Lord, we just thank you for your grace, Lord, for your forgiveness. Lord, that you just reach inside of their homes, Lord, this morning. Wrap your arms of love around them and let them know, Lord, that you love them more than they could ever know. Lord, we just thank you on this Resurrection Sunday. Lord, that you were born to die for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for the souls that are being making decisions for you this morning. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, man, we are so excited. The Bible says that all of heaven is erupting right now for those that made a decision. We're so glad. Please text LIFE to that number. We want to follow up with you. All right. We want to help you along your discipleship journey. All right. It is Resurrection Sunday. All right. I want you to have a great day. Okay. And I want you to stick around and join Pastor Susie and myself for the post show. All right. We're going to talk. We're going to have some fun. All right. Have a great Easter Sunday in Jesus' name.